So today's Lunch and Learn is sponsored by the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Uh, the theme is Integrated LA, the nation's largest manufacturing ecosystem. And the host is uh, Z Holly. Z is the uh, host of the, the uh, Art of Manufacturing podcast. She actually just did a terrific podcast with my boss, Jeff Krause, last week, which is available on her site. So I'm going to bring up Christina uh, Holly, and she is going to bring up the rest of her panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, and welcome everybody here today. Um, I want to ask you a question first. When you think about Los Angeles, what do you think about? Do you think about sun, you know, culture, palm trees, Hollywood, traffic maybe? <laughs> and that's what most people say when I ask them, especially people that are not from Los Angeles. But what I wish that they would say and what would think about are things like, Hyperloop and Mars Rover and SpaceX and high fashion and Second Sight that's restoring sight to the blind because these kinds of things are indicative of the true maker DNA that we have in this city and in this region. And a lot of people don't realize that LA is the largest manufacturing center in the country. We have uh, a half a million people working in manufacturing. That means for every job in film and television, there's four people in manufacturing. So it's a really important part of the economy. And so that's the reason that we're here today for this Lunch and Learn. Um, I have to thank the Department of Water and Power, Kiel Thompson, Brian Schweiker, because it was really their brainchild. Um, because, and you may ask, why is the Department of Water and Power hosting a lunch at West Tech? Well, if you think about it, they think a lot about water and power and about sustainability. And manufacturing being the kind of industry that it is and being as uh, water and uh, power intensive as it is, it's really to their advantage to, to help us be more sustainable and also for them to make manufacturers successful and to grow the sector. And so we'll hear a little bit more from the DWP, but also the idea is it's not just, you know, it's really hard sometimes, and let's face it, like, Working in California has its hurdles, right? Being in a large city, especially a region that's as complicated as Los Angeles, it's, um, there's a lot of complexity to work and so, uh, within the system. And so what we thought would be really valuable is to talk to many different experts across the city and also the federal government to find certain resources for you to make it easier to do business in Los Angeles. And we're going to have them come up in a little bit, but first I'm going to give a little bit, just a few words about a study that I did so we could talk a little bit about the manufacturing ecosystem. And then I have another great guest, um, Carolyn Casavan, who's going to speak about uh, sustainability and some ideas there. So, so everybody, welcome so much for coming. I'm curious, how many of you are actual, are manufacturers? Okay, fantastic, about half of you. Um, you know, I, I am a, an engineer myself. I have two mechanical engineering degrees from MIT and, and also, uh, well, I got a little distracted by the tech industry for about a decade. So I've been an entrepreneur myself. And so when Mayor Garcetti asked me to, whether I want to be an entrepreneur in residence, to look at the entrepreneurial ecosystem, I said, yes, as long as I can look at what I thought was an untapped and really important part of the economy, and that was manufacturing. And he was very excited about that. And so when I started looking at the ecosystem, it became very obvious that it's really complicated. Um, and so as a result, we partnered with Dun & Bradstreet and the LA Area Chamber of Commerce to do an in-depth study. Um, we looked at, um, we surveyed 1,600 businesses across the LA region. We also did roundtables. We looked at data across, um, you know, all of, all of the businesses across in the Dun, Dun & Bradstreet um, database. And we found some really interesting things. And I will just give you a couple of high-level things to frame the discussion. So first, LA manufacturing is complex. By some measures, we have 30,000 companies in aerospace and apparel and food and beverage, industrial, biomedical, so many different sectors within manufacturing. It's really difficult. You compare to San Francisco, for example, there's 600 manufacturers in San Francisco, in the city. 
And then, and then the, the county here in LA, we have almost 30,000. So very, very complicated, unlike any other city. And what we found was that the businesses are pretty, really established and for the most part very stable or growing. So when we asked whether they thought they were going to be growing in terms of employment and revenue, um, for the most part, everyone was either stable or in fact 30% were planning on hiring. This was in um, two years ago. And 42% actually projected an increase in revenues for that year. And the other thing is that the businesses are really established and I would say old, like 25 year old average. And that's good and also a risk. And actually, I just where's Bruce? Bruce Staub, he's concerned capital. So one of the things that they're working on, um, and maybe Adrian might mention it as well, is thinking about what happens, succession planning, what happens when the owners of these businesses retire? And I think that that's a huge vulnerability. But we're not going to talk too much about that today, but it is, it is a risk. But what this means is we have this huge established industrial base. And the, the thing, though, is that you know manufacturers want help. So they want to stay in LA, but they want help navigating the different regulations um, and all the different opportunities, taxes, et cetera. They want to hire skilled workforce, despite the fact that we met, we graduate more engineers than any region, any metro region in the country, a lot of them leave. And they're not always exactly the skills that we need for manufacturing. Um, and reliable work, right? Finding customers and a stronger LA brand. Those were some of the things, and also information about new tech trends as well. So these are the kinds of things that the manufacturers, the CEOs, the companies were asking for. We also found another group, very different and these are what I might call makers because I don't really like the term because it has baggage, but there's no word that really describes this d diversity. Um, actually, I think I saw Guy Okazaki walk by. He's like this legendary surfboard maker. Um, we have uh, roboticists, we have designers, entrepreneurs, chefs, um, special effects engineers. Think about the talent that we have from Hollywood. So these are the kinds of things that we have, but these folks don't necessarily always know how to scale their business. Um, we did a recent call for applications with, and I'll tell you a little bit about Make It in LA, but 67% were minority or women run businesses. So we have real diversity in this group. And this is the opportunity. 59% of makers want to increase the supply of their locally made goods. They want to look and they want to produce locally. 58% of manufacturers that we surveyed have excess production capacity. That means the majority of factories are sitting idle part of the time. So there's an opportunity to connect. I think the batteries are dying. Hello. There we go. So, um, so what ended up happening was after my term as EIR was up with the mayor, um, I decided we decided that it would be really important to take advantage of this opportunity. We launched Make It in LA last year, and it's a nonprofit organization. We just got our nonprofit designation a couple weeks ago, in fact. We help makers scale and, um, scale and manufacture in LA. Uh, we provide educational programming for both makers and manufacturers to connect and to scale. Um, we help introduce and build community, because a lot of it is you learn from other people, learn best practices and, and connections. And we also share, um, whether it's through content online, newsletters, um, and opportunities like this, speaking opportunities. Um, we distribute the Art of Manufacturing podcast on the website as well. And so this is, uh, and this is what we do. And I just want to mention one thing that's coming up um, on October 6th. Um, if, uh, if you're interested, we're doing this awesome event where it's going to be a walking tour, self-guided, through the arts district, behind the scenes of factories and businesses, demos, we're working with the LA Clean Tech Incubator, and then we're having this great party at a local shoe brand community. So mark your, mark your calendars. So with that, I uh, would like to bring up, <laughs> I always hate when, okay, there we go. If you have any questions, you can reach us here, um, make it in LA.org, connect, get on, um, make sure that you get invited to the events. And if you're interested in the podcast, go to the art of, or artofmfg.com. And I'd like to introduce our next speaker because, well, she'll tell you why. <laughs> Sustainability is important. But 
our next speaker is Carolyn Casavan. She is a chemical engineer with over 30 years of experience in sustainability, in environmental conservation, energy, water. Um, she was actually the founder of a very large consulting firm uh, called West Coast Environmental and Engineering. And, um, and she's really worked with the industrial manufacturing sector. So she's a true expert. And I'm really excited to have her talk about sustainability in a way that a lot of people don't think about. So um, if you would, come on up. And, uh, and then afterwards, we'll have some people come up for a little wrap session. Carolyn. <laughs> Thank you, Z. Um, can you hear me? OK. So I'm going to be talking about sustainable manufacturing. And I'm going to start off with what is sustainability? And what is sustainable manufacturing? And I'd like to say the first thing about sustainable manufacturing is it's positive. Instead of thinking of it as a cost, it's something I want you to think of as a, 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 a production center and as a profit center. It's a systems-based approach, the way I look at it. It's a systems-based approach that focuses on integrated solutions, which result in co-benefits and minimize negative impacts. Great. So why should you, do, why should you be interested in sustain, sustainable manufacturing? First of all, it boosts your brand. Retail customers want to know that you're operating sustainability. Your corporate customers are looking more and more at the sustainable practices of their vendors as they start looking at their supply chain to meet their sustainability goals. It also improves profitability. You have less waste, more efficient processes. It lowers your cost. It impro improves productivity by improving the work environment. Also, as you pay more attention to your production processes, you end up with uh, m more productive operations. It opens opportunities to develop new products and services. Again, as you start looking at your processes and your products, you start to think along new lines, and it, it opens up new opportunities for you. And finally, it helps protect your build business by being more resilient. And I'll talk with, about that a little bit later. So the steps to sustainable manufacturing are uh, first to characterize your operations and products. This is the most critical step in sustainability, and many people want to skip this step. They like to go straight to the solutions, but how can you solve a problem without actually understanding it? When you characterize your operations, solutions actually jump out right out at you. It's just amazing. Um, it shows you what is actually happening compared to what you think is happening. And, and we see this a lot when we go out and do audits for people, where what they thought was going on is not what's happening. It really makes a difference. And it helps you focus your efforts on where you will have the, the most uh, impact. Also, the next step is to investigate trends and new technologies in your sector. So you want to see what your competitors are doing, obviously. And this is a great, a great opportunity to see what's out there technology-wise for your operations. But you also want to take a look at your supply chain. You know, wh what is your supply chain doing that's sustainable? Also, what are some of the risks in your supply chain? And yet, you know, when you look at today's political climate and trade issues, that's a really important thing that we have to consider in terms of manufacturing. You know, which of your products, which of your raw materials are coming from overseas, and how much of your market is actually overseas. And so we want to make sure you're looking at those things and see what your customers are doing. So customers are changing too. And you may see that there are gaps in what customers need because they want a more sustainable operation. So by being able to provide them with a more sustainable product, you now have a new market. First thing then after that is to identify your immediate opportunities. And as I said, characterizing your operations, you'll get many of these near-term, easy opportunities will pop out from that process. You'll end up with a list, I guarantee it. Prioritize and plan how you're going to implement that. And, and integrate that process with your capital improvement plan and your operations and maintenance plan, or your maintenance plan, because you already have plans in place to replace equipment or purchase new equipment. Take a look at what your plans are, where you are going to be spending next money next year, and look at ways you can make that more efficient and more sustainable. So that's the place I always recommend that people start before you start looking at new investments. Um, and then brainstorm with your managers, your operators, your engineers, 
um, and your maintenance people about solutions and opportunities for sustainability. It's really important to involve everyone in the process. First of all, they have great ideas. They've been thinking about this. They can see a lot of things that we can't see. The other reason is if they're part of developing solutions, then they're also responsible for implementing these solutions. So working it into what they see as important will really help when it comes time to start implementing your solutions. Um, and finally, integrate your results into your business strategy. This isn't a separate process. It should be part of your business. Characterizing operations and resources. Um, starting, this, as I said, is one of the most important parts of your, your, your uh, sustainability planning. And you know, the first thing you're going to want to do is conduct energy, water, and waste audits. When you do that, um, I'd like you to analyze your energy and water use. You're going to analyze it overall, but also analyze it by process or product, and analyze it by type of equipment. That way, you can figure out where you're using the most energy and where you want to focus your resources. Also, the solutions may be similar for some of those things. Um, and another thing is I'd like you to analyze your bills, especially your electric bill, and I know LADWP is going to be talking a little bit about ways to reduce your, your energy costs, but most people don't realize that in a manufacturing operation, you, part of your cost is how much energy you use, you use, and part of your cost is actually your demand factor. So you want to make sure you're looking at both of those when you're looking at solutions. Uh, and then inventory your equipment and your processes by age, capacity, maintenance history. Uh, sometimes when you start looking at how much money you're spending on keeping it operating, you realize you would be much better off replacing it. Second, waste. Waste is a resource. You know, it's a raw, it was a raw material before it became a waste, and it can be a raw material again. And I think if you think of it that way, that way you see more value in your waste than just the cost of disposing of it. So look at your waste streams, tie them back to the sources, look at reducing waste from the front end first, then from there you can look at reusing your waste internally or finding a market for it externally. Begin tracking your material use um, and track it along with your production. Uh, a lot of people look at those two things separately, purchasing, maybe tracking materials, and you have some of your production product. Start looking at both of them together so that you can now see which product lines maybe are more efficient than other product lines, or maybe which facilities are more important than others. And then compile the practices and policies of your finance department, your HR department, your purchasing department, and, and your IT department. Um, these actually set the stage for what you can do and how you can do those things within the corporate structure. Um, it's all well and good to come up with plans and then find out the budget isn't there or the resources aren't there to do it. So, And then finally, uh, determine how you're going to measure your costs and savings, uh, how you're going to evaluate opportunities, and um, how you want to track bench, uh, your productivity, and also then benchmark your existing conditions so that you'll be able to see your improvements along the way. So I just wanted to give you an example of a project that we worked on a while ago. A client came to us wanting to purchase emission credits so they could expand their, their operations. And we said, let's see if we can reduce your solvent use instead. So the first thing we needed to do was to see how solvent was being used by department. Well, everybody was buying their solvent independently. There was no way to track it. So we implemented a centralized chemical purchasing and distribution system. This reduced the amount of solvent that was kept in inventory and it provided us with a way of tracking it. We implemented a database for tracking solvent use by department. At the first meeting with department managers before we implemented the system, this was an electronics firm. Uh, they cleaned parts using Q-tips. Every department manager said to us, oh, that's not us using that, all that solvent. We just use little bits. That's not us, that's somebody else. So after we came back with the results of the monthly reports of solvent uses by department, that first meeting, every department manager, their eyebrows went up, they left that meeting, and they went back to their departments to find out how they were using solvent, why they were using so much, and what they could do. Um, it, was, it was just 
so successful in terms of what they found out themselves. And they came up, up with some really like simple things that they had no idea were going on. The solvent they were using was an excellent cleaner. So people were using it to wipe down the plastic curtains between work areas. <laughs> so they replaced that with 409, went from $7 a gallon down to pennies per gallon, saved a lot of money. The other thing that came out of this was this whole culture then of continuous improvement. After that project, they continued, and, and by a, being able to track their material usage, they were able to continue to reduce their hazardous materials usage in a number of operations. Ultimately, they went to a no-flux solder, which eliminated the need to use solvent altogether. So they really were able to think outside the box and but, and then being able to see the results you know, gave them that positive feedback. The solvent use went down by 60%. They had no need to purchase emission credits. On top of that, they continued to expand and never had to purchase additional credits. Um, they, and then they, years later, I ran into the facility manager and he told me that after many of these changes had been put in place, their sick days went down by 30%. And that was really amazing. But when you think about that, all of the solvent they were using, they had ventilation systems, but a lot of that solvent was staying right there in the work environment. And by reducing the emissions in that work environment, they ended up making it a healthier place and they reduced their sick leave, something they never even thought. That's why I say go back and look at how you're going to measure costs and savings. It was really amazing. And that's it for me. So finally, just integrate your solutions into your business strategy. Um, so I don't have my notes for this one. Uh, integrate it with business goals. Adjust, adjust performance goals, not only for your operations, but maybe for your managers. And align it with your existing structure and culture and programs. Coordinate your funding resources, as I said, and plan for resilience. Thank you. That was such a fantastic platform and sort of a, a jumping off point for, for our panel. And since we have limited time, I want to quickly introduce everybody up on, and then we're going to get to know them over the next uh, 20, 30 minutes. So uh, if we can get Jennifer Kong, who's an environmental engineer with LA Sanitation, Kale Thompson, Economic Development Programs Manager at DWP, Michelle Yi, Senior Utility Services Specialist and Supervisor for Custom Performance Perfor uh, Program at LADWP, Dale Thompson, Manager of Emerging Technologies and Customer Programs at LADWP. Adrian Lindgren, who's the um, Business Development with the um, LA Mayor's Office. And also uh, Terry Batch with the Department of Commerce. And uh, so we have some great brains here. And at the end, if we have time, then we'll, we'll allow a couple extra questions. But I have tons of questions for you guys. <laughs> so first, um, and can you hear me without this microphone? We're good? OK. Um, I would like to ask. Jennifer, because you're with LA Sanitation, and so I would think that um, sustainability has to be top of mind for you. And um, uh, Carolyn was talking about how waste can be a raw material. And can you talk a little bit about what your role is and, and whether you've seen a lot of those things actually come true? Sure. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, my name's Jennifer. I'm the program manager for LA Industry, and it is a business outreach program. As Caroline mentioned, we are um, completely doing a cultural change because we are managing a lot of the waste stream and we wanted to look at um, how we can better uh, tap into the resources. So my role is to implement a green chemistry program where um, in a nutshell green chemistry is designing um, at the beginning phase where you design out the waste so then you don't end up with having to dispose it at the, at the tail end. So what would be an example of a client or customer that you worked with? Yeah, uh, in the textile industry, um, they have the zero hazardous waste um, substance discharge that they set standards for themselves. So then at the, t at the beginning end, um, every product that went into manufacturing, it's designed to be greener and cleaner. So they don't have to deal with the disposal at the tail end. And so what kind of a company was that? Uh, textile. Um, Got it. Textile. It doesn't have to be, but just it's textile company. Yeah, okay. textile and dye Got houses. It. Um, 
So how, if I'm a manufacturer, how can you help me? Do you have lots of money? What do we do? <laughs> uh, we developed a green chemistry manual that's available mm -hmm. online, and it's a systematic way for you to kind of assess all your processes, all your waste streams, and you can identify ways that you can um, reduce your chemical usage, find a safer chemical alternative. So then, uh, and the tail end, you're saving costs, you're reducing workers' exposure, and you also eliminate the disposal of uh, so hazardous substance. So it sounds like there's two different things that you can help with. So one is about reducing use of products, and that saves money, uh -huh. and then also helping people with compliance, which yes. is something that they have to do and sometimes can be very complicated to do. Yes. And I think you told me once a story about a brewery that was also doing something really interesting. Yeah, um, the breweries uh, approached us because they have spent grains that they wanted to get rid of, and it is a nutrient dense product and it's organic. So we're trying to divert organic waste from our landfill, and we were looking for ways that they can uh, beneficially reuse. So we uh, connect them with um, a manufacturer that's taking the organic waste, such as paper. Um, cardboards. <laughs> yeah, there. <laughs> 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 Hi, Joe. And then, um, then they can reuse that material to uh, manufacture construction material, um, furniture, uh, insulation That's cool. material. Yeah. That's fantastic. So, is there a fee for the service that you There's do? There's no fees. Awesome. Okay. Excellent. Free things are good. <laughs> All right. So, um, but. How would you afford these kinds of things? That's kind of one of the things I would wonder about. And Kale, you have some programs that might help the companies. If you could tell us a little bit about your program and your role. Okay, my. We're sharing mics here, so it's going to be a little. Is it on? Hello? Okay, there we go. Uh, my name is Kale Thompson. I'm the Economic Development uh, Programs Manager for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. And we have a loan program that's available to our commercial customers, including manufacturers. Uh, that loan program is, has great terms. It's a 10-year term. Our rate is 4%, and it's the same for all customers, no matter what your credit score is. Uh, the, the qualifications are that you must be a DWP customer, commercial customer, and we analyze your financials for your ability to pay. Uh, for instance, we have one customer who is going to be doing some water service upgrades to the tune of about $140,000. They're right now going through the process. And even though they're a company that has recently uh, declared bankruptcy, they'll still qualify for our program because we also have rebate, a rebate program that's gonna cover, that's gonna exceed the $140,000 cost for the project. And so we're gonna be using our own money to pay us back. And that customer qualifies because they qualify for these rebates even though they have recently filed bankruptcy. So this customer, can you say what kind of customer they are? Like what? I really can't. Okay, say. that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so they um, they don't have very good credit because they're going pro bankrupt, right? Like yes. what if like Equifax hack? Like now my credit's terrible. Like what do I do? Can I still get one of these? Loans? You can still get a loan as okay. long as you're willing to Amazing. share your financial information with us and let us analyze it. And if you can make the payments over the ten years for how much money you're asking, then we will extend the loan to you. Wow, that's very cool. So. Um, and what, that includes I would, equipment here at West Tech. Wow, oh, very good, good sell. So yes. um, I would think that people are rushing to you for these kinds of loans. Well, the thing is, not a lot of people are aware that we have the loans, and the loans are used for specific purposes. Like I was saying, it can be used for some of the technologies you see here at West Tech. The loans are used for installing sol solar photovoltaics. It's used for service upgrades, which is probably... Uh, of paramount importance to manufacturers that are expanding their business. It can be used for energy efficiency and water conservation measures. And that includes measures that you're going to implement to your building or if you're going to improve your processes. Um, and that would be energy management systems on your processes, if you're replacing compressors, if you find a technology here that's better than what you currently have and it's gonna be more energy efficient, we will extend a loan to your company or a company that you know to purchase that equipment. So what is it called so people can find this? This is called the Utility Infrastructure Loan Program. It's at, you can find information at ledwp.com slash UIL. Um, and you'll probably t be talking to me directly if you call the number that's there. <laughs> and to be clear, like a lot, all these resources, they're listed on the sheets in the back. So on your way out, make sure that you grab one of those. So let's talk about some of these energy saving things. Michelle, if you can talk about your program. Our programs are very uh, an excellent partner to them. Um, can you hear me? No. Nope. Nope. Oh, sorry. 
<laughs> our, pro our programs are an excellent partner to um, Kale's program. Um, the LADWP offers our customers numerous programs to help them save water and power in their place of business. Um, three major programs that we offer our manufacturing and industrial customers are our Water Technical Assistance Program, also known as TAP. So TAP pays rebates for you to save water in your business. So if you save water, we're going to pay you $1.75 for every 1,000 gallons that you save. And these um, water savings projects can include um, cooling tower efficiencies, recycling projects, or recirculation. Um, two really great projects that I was thinking about that I've been to their location, and I saw as we had a bottle manufacturing, um, beverage manufacturing company, as well as a pharmaceutical company, so they have a lot of cleaning that they have to do. They have to clean the bottles, or they have a lot of sterilization requirements. And so they're using all that water to clean it, but it's not getting that dirty, so they could still use it. So instead of just throwing all that water down the drain, why don't we recirculate that water to our cooling system, and we can have that water for a secondary use before we get rid of it. So that's one excellent way, and they got paid money to do that. So we're going to pay you to do that. Um, besides that program, we also have a commercial lighting incentive program. So if you have old fluorescent lighting or maybe some metal halide high bays in your warehouse that you're thinking about upgrading to LEDs, we're going to pay you to do that. Our incentives are very generous. It's $0.08 cents to $0.24 cents a kilowatt hour saved. It pretty much pays almost for the entire project. So this is an excellent time to take advantage of those incentives and do that project while we can do that for you, as well as our last program, which is my favorite program, because that's the program that I oversee. It's our custom performance program. And that pretty much covers everything else besides um, lighting. So that might be new motors, air compressors, um, building automation systems, cooling for your building, chillers, um, pretty much just everything else. Or anything that you can show us that will save energy, we'll take a look at it. We want to see it. Um, our incentives range anywhere from $0.08 cents to $0.30 cents a kilowatt hour saved. Um, some really good projects that we've had on the manufacturing side, um, we've had a lot of people with conveyor belts. So if you have a conveyor belt, it's usually on or off, right? And so you don't want that running at full power all the time, so they put variable speed drives on those so we could slow it down as needed instead of just running at full power. So there are energy savings there. We also have um, incentives for injection molding machines. So we had one manufacturer, they, they got a big contract to start producing some more units. And so they wanted to buy a new machine to be able to handle that new um, production load. And so um, we wanted them to do that more efficiently. And so we provided them a rebate to buy more efficient equipment. Even though they're using more power, they're doing it more efficiently. So we wanted to give them money and reward them for doing that. So we do have programs for that. So I want to ask Dale, because you, you two work pretty closely together. Yeah, um, and uh, so you look more at like the actual calculations of the rebates. And I'm wondering, what happens? You're growing. How do you know now all of a sudden my use is going up? I'm not going to get a rebate? Or how does that work? Um, yeah, you, you do get a rebate because uh, what we look at is uh, um, the baseline isn't always the baseline of what you had before. Um, in some cases, it'll be the, the baseline will be uh, the stand, industry standard practice. So if you're, uh, um, in, in this particular case, the customer was getting ready to uh, get a new injection molder. And um, um, in the industry standard uh, now is still um, hydraulic uh, um, injection molders. And they decided they wanted to buy an electric, which is more efficient, but it also costs more. Because they could have done it with a hydraulic for a lower price and still done the job, but there wouldn't be any uh, energy savings there. But if they bought a, uh, an electric, it's around 10% um, um, uh, increased cost, but like another uh, 15, 20% lower energy use. So um, on that particular case, we gave them a rebate that was about 40% uh, of the difference between the two uh, technologies. So really they're only paying um, an additional, right, almost a, like an additional 5% instead of 10% for the uh, cost of the, uh, uh, the new system. So and then they have the energy savings year after year. Then they got the energy year. savings year after year. And so it, it helps us because they were going to buy a new injection molder anyway because they, they needed to step up their production. So the, 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 the fact is they're getting a, an injection molder for a lower price and also they're saving energy on the long haul and it saves us because 
Either way, we would have been paying for the hydraulic, which would have been, which would have been worse. So that's how, that's how you know, they increase their energy use, but not as much as they would have. That's pretty cool. So free money. Where do they go for this? <laughs> uh, it's the LADWP.com um, under commercial programs and then under uh, custom performance program. Custom performance. What's the motivation for the DWP to actually pay people to use less of their product? I don't get this. I'm from the oh, private sector. What yeah. The <laughs> well, well number, well, number one, DWP is not really the private sector. It's the public <laughs> sector. Um, it's a public benefit. It's a, a non-profit, basically. All the, all the profit goes back to either the customers for these programs or it goes back to the city. So the, uh, um, that's one thing. And then the other thing is we don't want to have to buy to build new power plants. Uh, new power plants are, are billion, multi-billion dollar operations that take many years. And uh, especially in the current climate, you know, no one wants one in their backyard. They don't want the noise. They don't want, you know, possible emissions or whatever. So it's, it's almost, it's nearly impossible to locate a new power plant right now. So we're trying to bring everything down so we don't ever have to do that. And, and cool. uh, so that's, that's the real motivation. Cool. Okay. So the pattern now, I think you're going to guess. Adrian's next, right? <laughs> We've been talking a lot about sustainability, um, reducing, reusing, you know, all that. Um, what are some of the other opportunities for folks to just make, how is the city making it easier to do business with the city? And tell us a little bit about your role, actually. Uh, so, um, so thank you, Z. Uh, good to see everyone today. So in the Mayor's Office of Economic Development, I work on economic policy and business development. That ranges everything from technical assistance to our businesses. So getting you in touch with the right person, depending on what your needs are, if that's looking for another type of manufacturer or somewhere to source your materials, to um, working through permitting issues as you're expanding or relocating your facilities inside of the city limits. Um, and then we also work on the large scale initiatives that are more regionally oriented. So I know Z and I have worked around making it in LA, trying to stimulate more of the branding and awareness and outreach around uh, manufacturing and manufacturing careers in Los Angeles area. Uh, we also work on um, federal partnerships like the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership for Southern California, who I know is here today and hosted a session earlier. Um, they'll provide a much broader range of technical assistance services um, that you know, look at site development and infrastructure expansion to capital access and operational enhancements and improvements to issues like succession planning, like you were talking about earlier. Um, the other one that we're working on is the Department of Energy uh, Smart Manufacturing Innovation Institute. That's, um, that's a way for companies and manufacturers nationally, but also regionally, to engage in research and development and new methods for improving energy efficiency inside of their facilities by partnering with um, academic institutions and non-governmental partners to implement uh, smart manufacturing techniques into their facilities. Um, then we also do tax incentives and programs and uh, try and get, you know, make the, be the clearinghouse for all the resources in the area. So let's, yeah, so let's drill into that a little bit. But first I want to say, Adrian's a good person to know. I just was interviewing this uh, really interesting manufacturer, Divergent 3D. Kevin Zinger is the founder and CEO. And um, at the end he's like, I said, what's the best resource out there? And he said, Adrian Lindgren, <laughs> the city, uh, helps make things happen. So um, tell us a little bit, uh, for example, um, tax credits. People are always complaining about taxes, all right? So tell us a little bit about how we can get a little relief. Yeah, so I think, you know, California, more generally, is not necessarily a massive tax incentive state. There is actually, though, a lot of cash on the table for manufacturers specifically, um, unlike some other business areas. So you can look at anything from a California competes tax credit process, which is going to look at a competitive application process that will award um, dollars uh, twice a year to companies that are investing in their facilities, retaining jobs in the area, maybe have other opportunities to leave, um, but have decided to really commit to their position in California. Um, that is frequently very advantageous, especially for our manufacturers, who are also usually small businesses. Um, they're often set aside for the small businesses, and um, you know the dollar amount ranges from 75 to 100 million dollars uh, twice a year. Like I said, and we've had some really successful winners within the um, within the ecosystem here locally for this particular sector. Um, another is the research and development tax credit. So that's one that specifically addresses that PNL R&D in your um, you know in your line items. The They'll basically look at that and award you a 
credit based on what you put into developing a new product, especially as long as it impacts the manufacturing process line. Most people, if you developed or innovated on a new product in the last 10 years, you generally do qualify. Um, the other would be our sales use tax exemption. So that's going to look at it between 4 and 5%. Um, basically exemption from the state sales tax, and then there is an additional city incentive that gets laid on top of that. That's how I want to say about 1.5, 1.6%. That, um, you know, we recently assisted a company uh, in Chatsworth who was buying $250,000, $300,000 worth of equipment. So it made a big difference at the end of the day to get mm -hmm. that 4 or 5% back, and that comes in the form. How do people find out about that? Yeah, so we work closely with the governor's office of business and economic development, GoBiz. Um, some great people on that team, Jesse Torres, Jeff Malin, um, some of you may have interacted with them previously. We basically will do kind of an intake for your business, figure out where you're at, what you're looking for, whether that's workforce hiring and something like employee um, uh, training panel funding or you know making recommendations like oh you need to look at x y and z state tax incentive or here's what we can do at the city level and then we try and basically do a warm handoff and make sure that you're walked through that process and then if you have questions we kind of can be your resources to walk you through that and also we have a lot of links on our site with make it org slash um, incentives so we list that as well and and the paper in the back of the room too so <laughs> um there's so much there's so much. But let me just ask one more question about workforce development. That's one question that a lot of manufacturers say. In fact, just now Mike Freed from Nature USC is like, I need more people. Like, that, there's this misunderstanding that there's no jobs in manufacturing. Actually, workforce. Yeah, I mean, I think the jobs in manufacturing across the country are evolving and they're changing. Um, at the same time, the workforce is aging out. Um, I think one of the actual strengths of the Los Angeles region is that we have a pretty robust community college network. Um, LA Valley College has an advanced manufacturing training program. Um, you can look, if you're looking for a specialized training at somewhere like ELAC, that's going to provide uh, training in UAV development and piloting. You can access um, somewhere like an LA Trade Tech, which has some great vocational training, depending on what kind of skill level you're looking for. So part of what we try to do in collaboration with our Economic Opportunity Office and um, the Economic and Workforce Development Department, who I think is here today, mm -hmm. um, so it's been a great partner to us. Uh, yeah. They do some phenomenal work in terms of analyzing kind of what the workforce needs are and try to connect you to the right organizations and groups. Um, um, that can either help get you the kind of training that you need, provide feedback into the community college system where you see a need for a particular kind of position that's constantly going unfilled. I think the more that you express that to kind of yep. some of your representatives, we can then fill those needs and make sure that we have the pipelines available. And then, of course, I, I would say ETP funding from the state is one of the most under-leveraged but best assets in, ETP. in the state. So where do people find ETP funding? Yeah, so that'll go um, generally through state offices, but we can obviously make those connections. Um, and I believe that goes through the governor's office of economic business development as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I also want to mention, so the Maker Walk LA, which is on uh, October 6th. I don't know how many of you know that that's Manufacturing Day. Earlier that morning, there is something at LA Trade Tech um, yeah, so we'll have the mayor there and, and you know, in honor of Manufacturing Day, which I think is very much there to raise awareness in career pipelines available in manufacturing. We'll be at LA Trade Tech with community college students and also LA USD students. Um, you know, in Los Angeles at this point with College Promise, uh, you can actually have a very, very affordable um, access route to some really high value careers in manufacturing that allow you to really move up over time. So cool. we're very excited to celebrate. A lot of stuff going on. So finally, um, we're talking a lot about saving money. Now, how about making more money? Maybe, Terry, you could tell us a little bit about your role in the Department of Commerce. Okay. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you guys hear in the back? Yeah, okay. Okay. You can hear me. Okay, great. So my name is Terry Batch. I'm with the U.S. Department of Commerce, and you might be scratching your head wondering why. Why is the Commerce Department here? Um, the Commerce Department is made up of many different bureaus, and part of the, um, one of the bureaus within the Commerce Department is the International Trade Administration, and we promote international trade. We help companies to export. Um, so not only are we monitoring things that are coming into the country and making sure that countries are, 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 are playing fair in trade, but we're also helping companies to sell their products overseas. So after you've you know, saved energy and learned how to increase your capacity as a manufacturer, as you're manufacturing more products, you're going to need more pro people to sell to. And so our job is really to help you to sell. And the reason why I'm here in Los Angeles and not in Washington, D.C., is because we have a network of offices around the U.S. where we work with the local business community. And then we also have offices in our embassies and consulates around the world. 
And really the, the sole purpose of those offices is to help U.S. businesses do business in that country. Um, one of the flagship programs that we have, if you've, if you've ever worked with us before, is called a Gold Key Service. And basically that is helping you to find partners, helping you to find distributors or agents or customers in an international market. So I, I can go on and on about some right. of the things that we do, but um, that's if there's anything that you can remember um, from the Department of Commerce from today is that when you're looking to go international and you're looking for customers or you're looking to understand the, the landscape within a particular market, you can turn to the Department of Commerce for assistance. Awesome. And let's say I'm get, just getting started. How do I even know how and when to think about <laughs> trade and exporting? So one of the nice things about being here in Los Angeles is that there is a very robust international trade community. Um, everyone from the mayor's office to the ports to the community colleges, there are all types of training programs to assist you with developing um, international trade for your business. Um, the Port of Los Angeles has a really good program called Trade Connect, which is if you're just getting started and you just want to know what the resources are, they do a very good job of, of giving you the the information about who the players are and where do you turn for assistance. And then once you're really ready to develop a strategy for your company, there's a program called Export Tech. And actually, my colleague Elizabeth Glenn is here. Um, she runs that program. It's, um, it's administered by CMTC. And basically, it's a, it's a hands-on program with businesses to help you to develop an export strategy. It's three days. It's three full days that you have to commit. But at the end of the program, you'll have a pretty good understanding of what you need to do for your company to um, begin exporting. And then you'll also have a plan. So it's not just you sitting and hearing about all the different um, programs that are available, but you would actually be able to apply that to your business and walk away with an action plan. And I want to give a shout out to CMTC in general just because they do um, basically subsidized by the federal government from the NIST uh, consulting for manufacturing businesses. So They do a great job yeah. of helping companies not only become more efficient, but also to, to grow. Yep. Um, and... Uh, I guess, what, at what point does a company even think about doing this? Well, we talked about this. Um, really, you should be thinking about international right now. If, you're, if your sales are just focused on domestic sales, then you're missing a huge opportunity. We like to throw out a statistic at the Department of Commerce that 95% of the world's customers are, are outside of our borders. So if you are not in any way engaged in international, I would encourage you to get engaged. Um, look, look at the things that are happening in your industry. Obviously, with advanced manufacturing, I, I assume that most of you are in that sector that are here today. A lot, there is a lot of opportunity, and we put a lot of effort into assisting U.S. companies with that manufacture here, helping you to find opportunities overseas. Because really, the bottom line is jobs, and as you find more customers overseas, you can hire more people, and we can keep our economy going. So I would say if you're not looking at international yet, to get started and you can come see me. There's a lot of great resources that are um, just here locally in Los Angeles that can support you and that can help you with, through the process. And there's also incentives and help like STEM and uh, Exim Bank and things like that. Yes, too, right? and I would be remiss if I didn't mention my colleague here from Exim Bank. She's sitting over there in the corner. Exim Bank has a lot of great programs. We've talked about a lot of loans and things like that today by the utilities. Exxon Bank is an is a, is a agency that what their job is to do is to help you um, minimize your risk. A lot of companies don't want to do business overseas because it's risky. You don't know who you're selling to sometimes, and you don't know if you're going to get paid. Exxon Bank has a wonderful program to, that will um, ensure, they have an export credit insurance program that ensures your exports, and I believe it's 90%. The 90% or 95% of the value of your export, they can cover it for you, 95%. And it's a very low-cost insurance program. So a lot of times even banks won't lend to you unless you have X and bank credit insurance. So I would encourage you to see Marianne Hughes is sitting right there in the corner. And she has a lot of information about their programs. They also do um, financing as well for exports. Um, so if you have um, large capital equipment and you're selling it overseas and you need to, your buyer needs to be financed, they can help facilitate that as well. Cool. And we're talking about smaller businesses are also relevant to... We're talking um, about everybody. And everybody, right. So it's not just for everybody. And I also just want to give a shout out to Michelle. I think you have a program for smaller businesses, the commer 
commercial direct install. Yeah. Yes, for our smaller businesses who don't have that capital to purchase this new equipment, um, these are our smaller, less energy intensive. So anybody who has a demand of 200 kilowatts or less per month, um, you may be eligible for our commercial direct install program that provides free energy and water audits. So we'll go to your place of business, we'll take a look at your water and power use, and we'll make recommendations on where you can save. And depending on what you agree upon, we can even do that installation free of charge. So that's free lighting, free um, small water fixtures, maybe that might be aerators on your sinks and faucets, all of that free of charge. So if you're a small business, definitely take a look at that. Um, and on, that's on the big side, <laughs> Kale, can you tell us about, what about really big companies that are looking, maybe they'd want to locate in LA, anything that you can offer them? So uh, the Department of Water and Power sponsors a website called locatela.org. Locate dot LA. Locate LA. I think it's a locate dot LA. Locate LA. Yeah, oh, it's locate sorry. LA. Locate LA. Right? Com. I should know this. <laughs> but we have a website called locate LA.org. And it is a site that is GIS uh, powered. Yep. And it has heat, heat maps, layers of heat maps with different information that you would want to uh, know if you're going to relocate to Los Angeles. It has weekly updates of real estate listings for commercial and, and industrial properties. And you can also look to see what the workforce uh, demographic is for the area or the site that you choose. You can also look and see what businesses are around the, the site that's available so you can see who your competition is or you can locate in a place that's beneficial uh, where other customers are that you do business with. Um, and, and then the business promotion. Uh, yeah, and then once you find a site credits. on Locate LA and you move into the city of Los Angeles, if you are a company that reaches 100 kilowatt demand or greater on a monthly basis, then you're automatically qualified for an energy and water discount from Department of Water and Power. Um, and that's just for being a customer, just for being a new customer. As of October 16th, 2016, if you have a new commercial account with us, we'll give you an energy discount for the next three years just for being here. That's pretty cool. All right. Well, we don't have time for questions now. However, you're all going to be around, right? The, the um, DWP booth is just down this way, across from the massage chairs, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to spend some time there. Um, so if you have any questions, will you all be available for the next half hour to an hour? So please talk to these folks. There's so much to say, so much to talk about. Um, also, if you, next, I think we have uh, Titan Gilroy is speaking. So you might want to stick around for that. I know I'm going to be, yes. Yes, sure. Quick. So I was, I was sent here, uh, some of my colleagues, I, I just need to mention, next week we're having a conference. One of the oh, things yeah. that Commerce does is we, we put conferences on domestically here in the U.S. to connect you with our offices overseas. So if any of you guys want to get a, a plane ticket to Cleveland next week, we have an advanced manufacturing conference there. It's called Discover Global Markets, and it's for Europe. So if you're looking at doing business in Europe, we have our colleagues that are coming here from Europe to counsel um, you and to introduce you to, to the opportunities that are there. And I believe there's a couple of other markets featured like Mexico and Canada might be there as well. So you don't necessarily have to get on a plane all the time to go find the international, your international customers. We try to bring them to you. So um, if anybody is interested in that conference, let me know and I can give you information about it and you can get signed up right away. Did anyone learn something that they might use? Yeah? Okay, cool. I'm glad. Um, thank you so much for your time. Wait. Yeah, I just want to give yeah. one more shout out to our booth, 2822 Stop By. Yeah. So unlike a lot of these booths, we're giving out free money so that you can buy <laughs> this equipment. So yes. come and see us, 2822. So thank you so much for coming. Remember, manufacturing is sexy. <laughs> thank you.